Autumn, 1934. Hired Work. My father hired on at Wireless Power on Tuesday, excavating for towers. He said, I'm good at digging, and everyone who knows about our hole knows he's telling the truth. He might, might as well earn a couple dollars. Doesn't look good for the winter crop. Earning some cash will make him feel better. I don't think he'll drink it up. He hasn't done that since Ma. It's hard to believe I once brought money in, too, even if it was just a dime now and then for playing piano. Now I can't hardly stay in the same room with one, especially Ma's. October 1934. Almost rain. It almost rained Saturday. The clouds hung low over the farm. The air felt thick. It smelled like rain. In town, the sidewalks got damp. That was all. November 1934. Those hands. The Wildcats started practice this week. Coach Albright used to say I could play for the team. You've got what it takes, Billy Joe. Look at the size of those hands, he'd say. Look at how tall. I tell him just because I'm tall doesn't mean I can play basketball or even that I want to. But he'd say I should play anyway. Coach Albright didn't say anything to me about basketball this year. I haven't gotten any shorter. It's because of my hands. My father used to say, why not put those hand good hands to use? He doesn't say anything about those hands anymore. Only Arlie Wanderdale talks about them and how they could play piano again if I would only try. November 1934. Real snow. The dust stopped and it snowed. Real snow. Dreamy Christmas snow. Gentle, nothing blowing. Such calm, like after a fever. Wet, clinging to the earth, melting into the dirt. Snow. Oh, the grass and the wheat and the cattle and the rabbits and my father will be happy. November 1934. Dance Review. Vera Wanderdale's putting on a dance review at the palace and Arlie asked if I'd play a number with the Black Mesa boys. It's hard coming on to Christmas, just me and my father with no ma and no little brother. I don't really feel like doing anything. Still, I told Arlie I would try just because it looked like it meant a lot to him. He said he'd be dancing then, so he needed a piano player. Mad Dog will be singing, and he knew how I'd just love to be connected with anything Mad Dog's doing. The costumes Vera ordered come all the way from the city, she said. Special, the latest cuts. I wish I could go with her to pick them up. During rehearsals, Mad Dog comes off the stage after his numbers and stands by the piano. He doesn't look at me like I'm a poor motherless thing. He doesn't stare at my deformed hands. He looks at me like I'm someone he knows, someone named Billy Joe Kelby. I'm grateful for that, especially considering how bad I'm playing. December 1934. Mad Dog's Tale. Mad Dog is surrounded by girls. They ask him how he got his name. He says, it's not because I'm wild or a crazy untamed boy, but because 14 years ago when I was two, I'd buy anything I could catch hold of. My ma, my brother, Doc Rice, even Reverend Bingham. So my father named me Mad Dog, and it stuck. When I go home, I ask my father if he knows Mad Dog's real name. He looks at me like I'm talking in another language. Ma could have told me. December 1934. Art Exhibit. We had an art exhibit last week in the basement of the courthouse to benefit the library. Price of admission was one book or 10 cents. I paid 10 cents the first time, but they let me in the second and third times for free. That was awful kind. Says I didn't have another dime, and I couldn't bring myself to hand over Ma's book of poetry from the shelf over the piano. It was really something to see the oil paintings, the watercolors, the pastels and charcoals. There were pictures of the panhandle in the old days, with the grass blowing and wolves. There was a painting of a woman getting dressed in a room of curtains, and a drawing of a railroad station with a garden out the front, and a sketch of a little girl holding an enormous cat in her lap. But now the exhibit's gone, the paintings, stored away in spare rooms or locked up where no one can see them. I feel such a hunger to see such things, and such an anger because I can't. December 1934. Winter 1935. State tests again. Ms. Freeland said our grade topped the entire state of Oklahoma on the state test again, 24 points higher than the state average. Wish I could run home and tell Ma and see her nod and hear her say, I knew you could. It would be enough. January 1935. Christmas dinner without the cranberry sauce. Miss Freeland was my ma at the school Christmas dinner. I thought I'd be the only one without a real ma, but two other motherless girls came. We served turkey, chestnut dressing, sweet potatoes, and brown gravy, made it all ourselves, and it came out pretty good. Better than the Christmas dinner I made for my father at home, where we sat at the table, silent, just the two of us. Being there without ma, without the baby, wouldn't have been so bad. I just remembered the cranberry sauce. 
My father loved Ma's special cranberry sauce, but she never showed me how to make it. January 1935. Driving the cows. Dust piles up like snow across the prairie. Dunes lean against fences. Mountains of dust pushing over barns. Joe Day LaFleur can't afford to feed his cows. Can't afford to sell them. County agent Dewey comes, takes the cows behind the barn, and shoots them. Too hard to watch their lungs clog with dust, like our chickens, suffocated. Better let the government take them than suffer the sight of their bony hides sinking down into the earth. Joe Day LaFleur rides the range. Come spring, he'll gather rush and thistle, pulling the plant while it's still green and young, before the prickles form, before it breaks free to tumble across the plains. He gathers thistle to feed what's left of his cattle, his bone-thin cattle. Cattle he drives away from the dried-up beaver river, to where the Cimarron still runs, pushing the herd across the breaks, where they might last another week, maybe two, till it rains. January 1935. First rain. Sunday night, I stretch my legs in my iron bed under the roof. I place a wet cloth over my nose to keep from breathing dust and wipe the grime tracings from around my mouth and shiver, thinking of Ma. I'm kept company by the sound of my heart drumming, restless. I tangle in the dusty sheets, sending the sand flying, cursing the grit against my skin, between my teeth, under my lids, swearing I'll leave this forsaken place. I hear the first drops, like the tapping of a stranger at the door of a dream. The rain changes everything. It strokes the roof, streaking the dusty tin, ponging, a concert of rain notes, spilling from gutters, gushing through gullies, soaking into the thirsty earth outside. Monday morning dawns, cloaked in mist. I button into my dress, slip on my sweater, and push my way off the porch, sticking my face into the fog, into the moist skin of the fog. The sound of dripping surrounds me as I walk to town. Soaked my underwear, I can't bear to go through the schoolhouse door. I want only to stand in the rain. Monday afternoon, Joe Day LaFleur brushes mud from his horse. Mr. Ken Cannon hires my father to pull his olds out of the muck on Route 64. And later, when the clouds lift, the farmers, surveying their fields, nod their heads as the frail stalks revive. Everyone, everything, grateful for this moment, free of the weight of dust. January 1935. Hayden P. Nye. Hayden P. Nye died this week. I knew him to wave. He liked the way I played piano. The newspaper said when Hayden first came, he could see only grass. Grass and wild horses and wolves roaming. Then folks moved in, and sod got busted, and bushels of wheat turned the plains to gold. And Hayden P. Nye grabbed the Oklahoma panhandle in his fist and held on. By the time the railroad came in on land, Hayden sold them. The buffalo and the wild horses had gone. Some years, Hayden and I saw the sun dry up his crop, saw the grasshoppers chew it down. But then came years of rain, and the wheat thrived, and his pockets filled, and his big life came easy. They buried Hayden P. Nye in his land, busted more sod to lay down his bones. Will they sow wheat on his grave where the buffalo once grazed? January 1935.